Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second in the series of webinars to celebrate British Science Week 2021 with the theme of Innovating for the Future. So my name is Terry McStay and I'm going to be hosting today's session. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce today's speaker, Chris Jolly, from the Green Angel Syndicate, who's joining us all the way from Thailand. Now, Chris was born and grew up in Zimbabwe before coming to England to study engineering at Southampton University. After graduating, he joined the international oil industry, where he worked as a petroleum engineer for 34 years, before then leaving to pursue other interests. Following that, he went to study for a diploma in astronomy at University College London, and now he lectures on the subject as a STEM ambassador. Today, he's director of the Green Angel Syndicate, who invests in technology startup companies who are looking for solutions to the climate change crisis. And he also mentors young entrepreneurs. So Chris is going to be talking about some of the companies, some of these companies today, and also going to let you into the secret of what he thinks makes a good investment. So pay attention. Now, don't forget, type any questions that you might have in the chat and include your school name. And I'll ask Chris those questions or as many as I can at the end. So that's enough from me. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Terry. And good afternoon, good morning, afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for your interest. So I will just start the presentation. Okay, so um, as Terry said, I'm going to, to talk to you today about um, innovation for the future and specifically innovation relating to climate change, which is clearly a, a very pressing matter for the human race uh, today. Um, so what I will talk about, first of all, is a little bit about what is innovation and what makes a good entrepreneur. Um, and then I, what I'll do is talk a bit about, about the Green Angel Syndicate, what it is and how it works and, and what its objectives are. And then I'll talk about six of the companies that have been invested in by the syndicate in the, in the last three years, um, covering uh, companies which are involved in six different sectors, all related directly to climate change one way or the other. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll talk for a couple of minutes about what, what we see as the recipe for entrepreneurial success uh, of the startup companies. So the first question really is, well, what is innovation exactly? Um, it comes from the Latin word novus, meaning new, but human beings have always been innovative. Um, and by innovation, we mean where humans can use their uh, intelligence to, to solve complex problems. And this is a lovely little cartoon here, which kind of illustrates the point that innovation is not new. Cavemen 5,000 years ago probably strapped pieces of uh, leaf onto their arms and flapped their, flapped their arms to try to replicate the actions of a bird. And for sure, they learned very quickly that they couldn't fly. But 5,000 years later, we finally perfected it with the hang glider. So the message here is that innovation is not a new concept. It's, it's very much in the jargon of uh, startup companies and technology in this day and age. But innovation is not new. So a very simple definition, which I found on the internet, is that innovation is the application of human, human ingenuity to solving problems. And staying on the theme of the Stone Age again, this is Stonehenge, which I'm sure you, many of you have visited. It was built 3000 BC, in other words, 5000 years ago. And the stone that was used to build Stonehenge came from the Priscelli Hills here in, in the western part of Wales uh, in Pembroke. And, uh, and archaeologists have worked out that the stones were dragged on logs, probably, to the coast where they were put on to uh, barges or, or some sort of craft sailed along the coast, up the Severn estuary, and then along the River Avon, and then put back onto the logs again and rolled into place in Stonehenge. But these stones are absolutely enormous. They, they are nine meters tall and they weigh 25 tons. And to this day, we don't really know how they did it, but they were extremely innovative. And to have achieved something like that 5,000 years ago when people were in our modern uh, language uncivilized was really quite something. And I just made a comment here that conspiracy theorists don't believe that the Stone Age people built them. 
uh, and they reckon they were built in the 1950s. And this was a very strange experiment that was done at the time to show that you could lift one of these huge capping stones onto the top of, a, uh, of one of these columns using a, a crane at that time. So nowadays, most definitions of, that, that relate to the word innovation uh, or, or of the word innovation, sorry, relate to business. And this is a, an example I just plucked off a website from a company called VI Consultants. Innovation is the process of creating value by applying novel solutions to meaningful problems. And this is a Venn diagram which was on their website. And you can see the words novel, solution, and value here. And in order to innovate, you have to invent something or maybe you optimize something that is already done so that it's done better, or maybe you beautify something so that it has more value than it used to have. All of these things are innovation. So it's not just about inventing widgets, mobile phones or, or technology type uh, widgets, which is what a lot of people always um, uh, uh, link innovation to. The next thing really to, to tackle is what is exactly is entrepreneurship? Well. Um, entrepreneurship is, is defined nicely again, I found this on the internet, the capacity and willingness to develop, organize and manage a business venture, along with the associated risks, and that's something I'll come back to later, to make a profit. Uh, and the word is interesting, it comes from the Latin word interprehendere, which corresponds to the French verb meaning, uh, or entreprendre, which means to grab or take control. And that doesn't actually sound very nice, but the reality is that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to make money because if you don't make money, you're not an entrepreneur and you won't be able to establish a business that is successful. And I rather like this little cartoon here of Robin Hood sitting in front of the principal of the college where he's studying social entrepreneurship and he's being told that robbing the rich to pay the poor is not really what social enterprise is about. So here are some famous entrepreneurs. Most of these guys, in fact, all of them are uh, recent entrepreneurs. There are lots throughout history, but they all are uh, successful for different reasons. This guy invented something, Bill Gates. He invented the first PC operating system. In the early days when PCs were built, you used to have to type in command lines for the PC to do anything at all. Then Bill Gates came along and he invented an operating system where you could start to click stuff and, and just use simple commands and so forth. And that was the beginning of, of PCs and, or PC operating systems, which are now in mobile phones and everything else. And he's a very, very rich man because he invented something very clever. Mark Zuckerberg, as everybody knows, founded Facebook. His motto is to move fast and break things. And sure enough, he broke a lot of rules to get to where he is with, with Facebook today. Um, this man you probably haven't heard of, uh, and it's, unfortunately his name is hidden behind one of the little screens here, and I can't remember his name, Ingvar something. He is a Swedish guy who invented flat-packed furniture, so you can probably guess that he was the founder of IKEA, and he created a new market. There had never been a market before for flat-packed furniture. A very clever concept. This guy, Stelios Hajiyanu, founded the first low cost airline in Europe, which was EasyJet. And he did things better than the established big airlines like British Airways. He cut costs, he kept the frills out of the package, he kept prices down, he used small airplanes, he flew more frequently, he moved a lot more people, and he became a very, very successful, or it became a very, very successful airline, which has been copied by many others since. This guy, Travis Kalanak, founded Uber. And Uber has had a huge impact on the global taxi business, which will be forever. He disrupted the market by having a simple idea, which he put into practice uh, by using a, a platform, an app. Um, and so he disrupted the market and made a fortune doing it. Then you've got Elon Musk, who's probably one of the most high profile uh, innovators today. Um, he, he actually made his money because he set up PayPal, which he sold for a fortune some years ago, and he used the enormous amount of money that he made to start up Tesla. Um, and when he started up Tesla, everybody was saying, you're too early, mate. He, the world isn't ready for electric vehicles. But you know what? He defied everybody, and he did it anyway, and he's proved to be right. And he now has the most valuable car company in North America, even though they only produce small numbers of vehicles still. So the thing that characterizes all of these people is self-belief 
and a determination to do things differently, to innovate. So I'm going to now switch to talking about climate change. Not, I'm not going to lecture you about climate change. The whole world, except Donald Trump, knows that climate change is real and that it's serious. This is just a huge number of headlines from newspapers. And everybody on the planet now knows it's climate change. And it's something we need to be very worried about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the Green Angel Syndicate is a, uh, an investment syndicate. And, and what an investment syndicate is, it's a group of individuals who uh, work together to invest in startup companies. And they also support those companies by bringing their experience uh, to, to the management teams to help them to succeed in, in what they're trying to do. And today, the, the syndicate was founded in 2017, and it's one of the fastest growing syndicates now in the UK, perhaps not surprisingly because of the, the climate crisis. Um, the name green is the, is the clue. The, the syndicate focuses on uh, startup companies that are developing goods or products or services that are needed to fight climate change and global warming. And we today have got 250 members uh, it's exploded the, the growth in the last 12 months. It's really very interesting how people are becoming involved in this. And today, the syndicate has invested in 24 companies in six sectors, which we look to invest in because we consider them to be very significant and, and related to climate change. Renewable energy is obviously one of them. Urban microtransport, that's actually electrical, uh, electric transport of one sort or another within city environments. Future buildings, which is about building more efficient buildings in future so that we don't have so much heat loss uh, from our, from our um, property infrastructure. The circular economy, which is about recycling, which is becoming a very hot topic. Agricultural technology to, to avoid waste uh, and to, to maximize yields. Uh, and water management. Water is becoming a very precious resource uh, in the world today, and it's becoming increasingly important to manage it very, very carefully. And then for me personally, this is my favorite, environmental, uh, protecting the environment is so important in the, in, the global, in the fight against global warming, and actually trying to restore the environment as best we can where it's been damaged. So I'm now gonna talk to you about uh, a few of the companies uh, in these categories. So the first one I'm going to talk about is, is a company called Naked Energy. I'm not quite sure where they got the name from, um, but the problem that they set out to tackle was climate change has caused, is caused by CO2 emissions from energy used in homes uh, in the UK. And this is a chart from the UK government, which shows of all the energy consumed in the UK every year, about 29% of it is consumed in our homes. And of that, hot water is about a quarter of that 29%. So what Naked Energy came up with, which is very innovative, is a renewable energy system that converts sunlight not only into electricity in the way that solar panels do, but also it collects usable heat. And the way they do it is that they build uh, the solar panels inside a glass tube, which is vacuum, which is um, uh, X, What's the word I'm looking for? Emptied anyway, and is, has got a vacuum inside it. And when the sun shines on the solar panels, as it goes through the glass, you get the greenhouse effect. So it warms up the, the, uh, the, the tube, and the heat is collected and taken into the house um, uh, to, to heat the water in the house. So you're getting twice, uh, you're getting a double hit from the solar energy now. You're not only generating electricity, but you're also collecting heat which is used to heat hot water in the house. And these uh, tubes can actually achieve about an 80% efficiency in the collection of solar energy, which is considerably higher than normal solar panels, which just sit outside. And this is how they're deployed. This is the outside of a building, and you can hang these things on the outside of a building, or you can put them on the roof or on, on the ground. Wherever there's direct sunlight, you can use these tubes. The next uh, company I'd, uh, I'd, I'll talk about is called Zedify. And the problem they set out to, to solve is that the streets in our cities are jammed with slow moving traffic. And they're, because it's slow moving and not doing much, it's emitting a lot of CO2 that's unnecessary and causing pollution, obviously. We hear a lot about uh, people with respiratory problems living in the cities. And much of the traffic in the cities nowadays, particularly after COVID, where everybody went online very quickly, is couriers delivering parcels to end customers. 
And a typical courier's day run, a daily run inside a city would start with going to the depot in the morning, picking up 30, 50 parcels or something like that, and then having to drive through all these busy streets, dropping off uh, deliveries all over the place and collecting uh, stuff from uh, customers and bringing it back to the depot. So the couriers spend all day driving around the streets at very, very slow rates, burning diesel fuel. So the, what ZFI came up with is uh, a solution, which is to use zero emission electric bikes to do what's called the last mile delivery. So in other words, if a company like Amazon has a distribution center out in Warwickshire or somewhere, they load up their truck in the morning or a big lorry with all of the stuff that has to be delivered to London that day. And they drive into, into London to a, to a place where ZFI have got what they call a node, but it's actually a warehouse where all of those um, products are offloaded and the lorry then returns back to the distribution center and ZFI then deploy all of their electric bikes to, to deliver these packages to the customers. So they're not polluting the streets, they're able to jink in and out of the traffic and they're able to, to, to deliver much faster and much more uh, to much more accurate uh, timings than the guys who are driving around in a big van burning diesel all day. So it's a very smart business, this, and they're doing extremely well, I'm pleased to say, and you'll see their brand, I suspect, cropping up in a number of cities uh, in the next year or two. <clears throat> the next type of business is future buildings. So this is companies that are trying to find ways to reduce the energy consumption in our homes. The problem in Britain is that there are tens of millions of homes in the UK that were built with air bricks underneath uh, or near the ground to allow ventilation underneath the suspended wooden floors in the houses, particularly during the Victorian era. And the reason that, those, that you need ventilation under the wooden floors is to prevent damp. So homeowners in Britain, unfortunately, though, struggle with, with cold, uncomfortable drafts and very high energy bills because wind blows in through these air bricks, but it, it, the, the flooring is often very poor and it leaks up and into the, into the house. And, and so a lot of homeowners simply block off the air bricks using tape and so forth to reduce the, the, the breezes or the, the drafts that are blowing through their houses. But that causes damp and condensation problems. So that doesn't actually solve anything. So it is a serious problem, particularly in social housing in the UK. Um, you'll notice here that uh, the domestic uh, heating in the UK accounts for about half of the energy costs of every household. So it is a huge uh, challenge to try to reduce this, this uh, energy consumption. So AirX came up with an incredibly clever solution. This is a, an original air brick that was put that was built into the into the wall of the house and you can see it's quite close to ground level and, and it's just below the floor level in the house which is probably about here. And what they do is they dig out the original air brick and they put in an air brick which has got a flap in it, a, a, um, a shutter. And that shutter is controlled by a hub inside the house, which takes readings of the temperature and the wind direction outside, and also looks at what's going on inside the house. How, what is the air quality like? Does it need, uh, do there, does there need to be more ventilation? Is it cold? Is it warm? And basically it reduces the, um, uh, the heat loss in the house uh, by optimizing the setting of the shutter at all times. And, in, and it, of course, improves the comfort of everybody in the house and it, without compromising the air quality in the home. You will see, I think you will see a lot of this uh, technology soon because the government is uh, requiring all of the energy companies that provide your gas and electricity to invest in this kind of technology in people's homes to try to start reducing carbon emissions because of um, inefficient uh, household heating systems. Recycling, I don't really need to say very much about the plastic problem, I'm sure of that. You've all seen um, Rich, uh, David Attenborough's uh, program about the oceans. It's absolutely shocking what's going on. And the world is blighted by single use plastic, which is not biodegradable. This is a photograph from the Caribbean Sea, just a massive mat of plastic. This poor surfer here is, but she's not walking past a, a rubbish dump, she's walking down a beach to try going surfing. It is absolutely appalling what's going on in the world. 380 million tons of plastic waste is generated every single year. 
and 90% of it is not even recycled. And this is a shocking statistic that I found on the internet this morning. There are 46,000 pieces of plastic in every square mile of the ocean on Earth. It's really, really appalling. Smile Plastics have come up with a way to transform inert plastic waste, chemically inert plastic waste, into beautiful decorative panels for architecture and for the design industry. And they make this plastic from plastic bottles, yogurt pots, plant pots, food packaging, and even coffee grounds. And so when you, when you want to order uh, uh, some of these um, decorative panels, you tell them what colors you want and, and so on. And they then pick out of the, the plastic the colors and things that they need to produce these beautiful panels. And these are just examples of the kind of panels. If you look around Britain now, you'll start to see that shops like um, Starbucks are starting to buy these panels and putting them up on the wall because they're obviously very environmentally uh, positive uh, for the image of, of Starbucks. So keep an eye out. And if you see these kind of panels, let them know that you know where they came from. The other thing it's useful for is actually it's very easy to work and it's waterproof. So they use it, uh, it can be used to make things like this, beautiful display counters and furniture and cabinets and signage and things like that. So it's a, it's a fantastic product. Um, it, they've got proprietary technology that, that enables them to, to reprocess the plastic without using huge amounts of energy. And it produces these beautiful uh, products. Okay, the next one I'm going to talk about is an agricultural technology company called Better Origin, and you'll see why it's called that hopefully in a minute. The problem that they're trying to solve is that globally, one third of all food produced on this planet goes to waste. That is a shocking statistic. And much of the waste ends up in landfill and just turns into methane gas because it rots. And when it rots, methane gas is emitted, and that is one of the worst greenhouse gases that there is. Um, and this is an interesting statistic here. If food waste was a country, it would be the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. That is pretty shocking. And the global population on Earth is expected to reach 9 billion or so by 2050. And when that time comes, we need to have increased food production by about 70% to meet the demand. So it's really important not to waste food. And this is a this is waste food at the back of the food processing plant. So this, this is probably, <clears throat> excuse me, a company that produces food for the supermarket chains. And you can see that it's a mixture of vegetables and fruits and everything else. And as they are producing these beautifully packed salad packs that you buy, which are ready to eat and things like that, an awful lot of stuff is also getting thrown away because it's got leaves that are torn or bruised or something like that. And it just ends up in a massive heap like this, which is terrible. So uh, Better Origin came up with a really clever idea, which is to use insects, specifically fly larvae, things like this, to convert waste food into high quality animal feed. Insects will eat any food waste, or larvae anyway, will eat any kind of food waste. It doesn't matter if it's rotten, it doesn't matter if it only, uh, was only thrown out yesterday or five weeks ago, it, they will eat anything. So what they do is they built these a couple of these units, this is a shipping container, and inside the shipping container, there are trays uh, where, the, um, where the larvae are put uh, in among sawdust, and then food uh, is brought from, say, a uh, food processing factory somewhere. It's pulverized and turned into a filthy mush, which is then put in through a, a funnel at the top of the, uh, the container, and it, and it is controlled by um, uh, electronic devices inside the container to, to keep feeding these, um, these larvae at, at a steady rate. The temperature in there is kept constant, the light's kept constant and so on. And after about a week, you get these fantastic fresh larvae, which are perfect for chickens and salmon. At the moment, most of the poultry and, and fish uh, in the world is fed reprocessed food. Uh, or um, say the guts of the chickens are reprocessed and fed back to the chickens and so forth, which is a terrible problem, uh, especially when disease gets uh, into the flock. So this is a, uh, I like the, uh, the little um, uh, strap line that they put here, fixing the broken food chain. We are people, we eat something and we throw away a lot of food. Instead of throwing it away into the environment, 
we now turn it back into a food product which is eaten by a chicken and a chicken loves to eat uh, uh, insects and we then eat the chicken. So it's a veritable or a virtuous food uh, system that we're creating here, which is circular. It's a tremendously clever idea. And this, these containers are put on site where the, uh, the fish farm is or where the chicken farm is so that the, these uh, larvae are coming straight out and into the, um, into the feeding bowls. The next one is a, uh, a company that does environmental services, a little company called Scottish Bee Company. The problem that one of the problems we have in the world is that one third of all the food we eat in the world is pollination dependent. In other words, some little creature, and it can be butterflies, beetles, bees, hoverflies, moths, or wasps, have to pollinate the flowers before a fruit or a vegetable uh, will, will appear on a plant. But the trouble is, pollinators are under a tremendous threat from parasites, from invasive species from the overuse of insecticides by farmers and, and gardeners, and generally a loss of habitat. There's so much uh, of the original uh, forestry that's been removed, and uh, there are less and less places where these creatures can live. And this is a very interesting graph showing the decline in pollinating insects in Britain. And just to explain to you how this works, this figure here, what they call the occupancy, is an estimate of how much area within a one square kilometer uh, on the map is a place where pollinators can live. And these are all the various types of pollinator. And you can see up here what they are. So all of them are declining, which is very worrying actually. And, and the area that they have to live on is getting smaller and smaller. So what did Scottish Bee Company came up with? Their solution is to combat the decline in pollinator numbers by helping to boost natural wildflower spaces for the pollinators to thrive. And what they do is they produce fantastic Scottish heather honey in, in Scotland, obviously. They've got more than 450, probably close to 500 hives in Scotland producing this honey. And it's, it's now been recognized as a fine a product, product as man, manuka honey from New Zealand. It has got a tremendous amount of potassium in it, which is very, very uh, good for one's health. And it also has been awarded the kite mark, the British kite mark. That means it is an absolutely pure product with no contaminants that is uh, and, a, and a verifiable supply chain uh, behind it. And it is the first food product in the UK to ever get a kite mark. So it is a genuine premium product and it sells really well, particularly in the Far East, in Japan and Singapore and places. And every gift pack that the Scottish Bee Company sells is comes with a little packet of wildflower seeds, these little things here. And the idea is that when you get your package, obviously you go to your garden and you establish a little patch of wildflowers, which is exactly what the pollinators need to be able to, to survive. Some of the profits from the Scottish Bee Company are channeled into a little business or a little charity they've set up called Repollinate. And what repollinate does, it, it aims to educate people and to encourage them not to kill bees, to establish these pollinator-friendly habitats in their gardens and to stop using insecticides and to buy bee-friendly products for use in their gardens. So it's a, a really, really smart idea. So just before I uh, move to the next section, so really what I want to emphasize here is that these are all relatively small companies. They're all doing smallish things at this stage. Some of them could grow to be big international companies perhaps, but the reality is that every bit counts. And you can see from this, it's not only about inventing widgets, it's about having clever ideas, it's about looking after the environment. There are so many ways in which startup companies can make a difference. And the more startup companies there are, and the more they get involved in this kind of stuff, the better it's gonna be for the planet. So, Talking now a little bit about entrepreneurship and, and the Green Angel Syndicate's view of that, um, the things that characterize the founders of the most successful companies in our portfolio today, and I, as I said, there are 24 companies, so the six you've seen are uh, a small number. They are all innovative, entrepreneurial, and enterprising, all of them. And the word enterprise I haven't used before now, and it's often associated with entrepreneurial ventures uh, and people who have had success in, in being an entrepreneur. Uh, and an enterprising person is somebody who's willing to take on a new project, uh, and, and a new product, uh, project, sorry, 
would be, in this case, the starting of a company. It's not to be confused, of course, with the Starship Enterprise. Okay, so when what when we look for when we're looking to invest in companies uh, as the Green Angel Syndicate, we look for uh, a number of things which are really important. The first is we want to see a really good business concept which is linked to the fight against climate change. So it's an idea, and it's an idea that's been developed, uh, and and the beginnings of a business idea are starting to come out of it, and. Very importantly, there has to be what's called a sound commercialization plan. That means you need to understand what, how you're going to take your very clever idea and actually make money with it. Because if you don't make money, you're wasting your time and you won't be able to, to build a business. So working out how to take a clever idea and putting it into a plan that will make money is a really, really important aspect of uh, starting up a company. The other thing we tend to find is that uh, a lot of startup company uh, founders um, have unrealistic cost estimates and timelines. They, they underestimate how much it's going to cost and they also um, underestimate how much time it will take to actually become a, a revenue generating and uh, successful company. But above all else, the most important thing that, that we look for when we're trying to decide uh, to invest in a company is a, a really diverse, interesting team that works well together is innovative, is bold, receptive to external advice, and are really committed and focused on trying to make a success of what they're trying to do. And that, in essence, is uh, the secret to success for startup companies. So I hope this inspires some of you who may have interesting ideas. Um, if, if you uh, do have interesting ideas, please have a look at the uh, email address, or sorry, the, um, the website address that I've got here on the final slide. Um, by all means, go and make an inquiry. Um, if you want to talk to somebody, just get in touch because uh, we're always interested to help anybody who's got interesting ideas, especially if they're related to, to uh, tackling climate change. So with that, thank you very much for listening and I would be very happy to take some questions. Terry, you're on mute. <laughs> it had to be me that, that was on mute this time, wasn't it? Thanks for that, Chris. That was fantastic. Could we all give Chris um, a big round of applause, please, or jazz hands if you if you prefer? Um, I was particularly interested, Chris, in your 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 description of the, the issue of food waste. I remember quite a few years ago we did some work for a company who were wanted to use ozone to keep fruit and vegetables um, or preserve them when they're being transported from the farm to the supermarket. And I was horrified that some I think with strawberries, almost half of the strawberries that are harvested never even get to the supermarket, let alone the, the customer. So, yeah, anything that can that can that can help that has got has got to be a good yeah. thing. Yeah, um, great idea. That. So we've got some. Um, we've got quite a few questions, um, in particularly from um, from Chloe at Sydney Russell. Shout out to Chloe. You've asked some great questions there, so we'll try and um, fire some of those at, at, at Chris. Hopefully, you'll be able to answer them. Um, in terms of, I mean, you've talked about some amazing ideas and inventions that have been put forward. So if, if one of the people watching today has a really good idea, what would you suggest they did first? Who should they, who should they go first? Um, I would always suggest that uh, a good idea would be to, to find somebody as a mentor. That's probably very important. Somebody who's got a little bit of experience uh, and is able to give you some, some reality checks on your idea and and whether it's likely to to be something that would work or not i think there are an awful lot of people that think uh, just writing an app is going to make them a, a fortune there are thousands if not millions of people writing apps and, and i think um that's always kind of the default that people first go to but um really i think a business needs to be more than an app um strictly speaking um and uh but as I say, trying to find somebody that has experience of business who can actually tell you what you have to do to actually start the whole process. So in, in about in two minutes, I can explain that you, you start off typically uh, with what's re often referred to as the family and friends phase, where you convince a number of your friends and family that the idea is a good one, and they give you maybe 10,000 quid to go away and start writing a business plan and, and developing something or some ideas and so forth. If that goes well, you then approach what's called a seed round. And that's where people like the Green Angel Syndicate get, in, uh, get involved. At that point, you have to explain 
your concept, you have to show something, uh, a business plan of some description, also explaining how you're going to turn it into money and when and so on. And, and if the investors like it, they will put money into the business and that then allows you to move to the next stage, which is called the proof of concept, which is, okay, now go away. You told us you got this great idea. Show us that people will pay for this. And so you go away and you develop your widget or whatever it is, and you start selling some, and then you can come back to the investor and say, okay, look, I've managed to sell a number of these widgets. There's lots of demand for it. It's working. Um, and you then raise more capital, which is called the A series typically, which allows you to then start to grow the business. So you then put more people in your team. You start to maybe open a little office somewhere. You start to uh, create um, relationships with somebody maybe who's manufacturing something for you and so on and so on. So it's there is a series of steps to go through, but starting off blind, I think would be a, a bad idea. You really need to at least understand where the journey is going to take you before you st before you plunge into something like this. Otherwise, it will be very frustrating, I think. But in terms of where to go for advice, I mean, I would suggest that you, you could always look up angel syndicates. Angel syndicates are places where there are people like me and the other 250 people in our syndicate who are willing to try and help entrepreneurs. We have experience. Most of us are old and gray and pale and stale and so forth. But we have experience that we can help uh, bring to help you. I think that's probably a good place to start. Thanks, Chris. And actually, Andy Turner, who was doing the talk yesterday, um, said a very similar thing. Don't try and do it on your own. There are lots of people out there that, that can help you yeah. and give you some advice and may, maybe even tell you that you're not getting it quite right and you need to do things yeah. differently. Um, we've got a question from, from Chloe, who I mentioned earlier. Um, what is your favourite invention? And let's assume she, she means ever just to make it difficult for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the mobile phone because I'm a... I'm wondering if that's Chris's internet connection. So I'm assuming another of his favorite inventions isn't broadband. Um, right, now, so... Uh, sorry, Chris, I think we may have lost you there. You lose me. Yeah, so... Okay, okay I'm glad you hear my answer, but I'll say it again. <laughs> it's given you a, bit, um, a little bit of time I to think of think my answer. Scuba gear, scuba gear, because it opens up a whole world which you would never see otherwise. I love scuba diving. <laughs> Brilliant answer. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, in terms of um, the things that you've invested in, which is the one that's made you most kind of excited? Yeah. Um, I actually really like AirX, the, uh, the, the, the air brick. I think that's a tremendously clever idea and I wish I'd thought of it. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot of them uh, used and it's gonna make a big difference to people's quality of life, especially if they're paying a lot for their energy bills. So I, I, I really like that one. Okay. Um, and now, I mean, because most of the people watching this or at school, they're interested in what you enjoyed um, at school. So what did you particularly enjoy studying at, studying at school and who was there someone who inspired you? I did, uh, I did geography and I did physics and maths. Um, and the reason I picked those subjects is because uh, I grew up, as you said, at the beginning in Zimbabwe and on the Zambezi River, there is a massive concrete arch dam that was built in the 1950s to supply water and electricity to all of Central Africa. And my father took me there as a child. And I remember standing on top of this huge damn wall and just overawed by it. And I thought then, I, you know what? I'd really like to be a civil engineer. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> it was very inspiring. Mm. And I think that's true for, for a lot of people, isn't it? You, you, it's, it's often things that happen yeah. quite early in your life that yeah. really stay with you. And yeah, it's inspiration comes from somewhere. And you just never know when it's going to come. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, I've got some quite big, tough questions here. Um, what do you think the next climate change invention will be? Or what does it need to be, would you say? Is so there something that's I, a silver bullet? I don't think there's a silver bullet, but I do think that um, what we really have to try and look at is ways to go negative with carbon uh, rather than zero. 
to try to look at ways to, to start taking carbon out of the atmosphere again. That is a massive undertaking when you look at how all the carbon got into the atmosphere in the first place. But I, I would say this, that um, the, there was a very interesting little company that came to see us recently that, um, that have, uh, are focused on trying to restore the natural ecosystem that was in the soil before we started um, intensive modern farming. Because that ecosystem, which is all the, the fungus and the bacteria and the nematodes and all the stuff that lives under the ground, they lock up huge amounts of carbon. And that is the one thing where we could really make a difference within 10 years. If we really put our minds to it and abolish chemical pesticides and so forth and start using biological uh, methods to control weeds and, and pests and so on, and really return the, the soil to the to original condition it was in, we could take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. And in fact, if, if, if anybody's interested, there is a fantastic documentary on, um, uh, on uh, Netflix called um, Kiss the Ground. And it is exactly about this subject of how we could really, really make a difference to the climate change crisis by concentrating on the arable or the farmed lands around the world, which is a huge area and a massive carbon sink potentially if we can return it to, uh, to better days. And that's, that's unlike, you know, for instance, trying to reestablish a tropical forest, which would take 500 years. You could do the soil in 10 years. We could really make a difference and quickly. And I suppose we're now at the stage where we need those quick. We so do. It's, it's, it's time, really is, time is ticking, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's linked to a question from, um, from Tom at, at Baden Powell. So he's asking, if we don't do anything to stop climate change, you know, what, what might happen and how, how quickly mm -hmm. will it happen? It's a bit of a, a depressing I, question, but it's one we need to ask, isn't it? I, here I put on my uh, astronomer's hat and... Um, when I hear people glibly talking about, yeah, well, we'll just hop in a spaceship and fly off and find another planet to live on somewhere. As somebody once said, there is no planet B. And just to give some context to the comment I just made, if you got in the fastest spacecraft ever built on Earth and you headed off to the nearest star, which is called Proxima Centauri, which is four light years away, it would take 17,000 years to get there. So any idea that we're just going to hop in, in a plane or in a spacecraft and go somewhere else is, is clearly the, the, work, the work of science fiction. We have to look after this planet. It's really, really important. The Earth will survive because in, in its history, there's been periods when it's been hot and cold. There was a time when the Earth was covered in, in it was just basically a huge snowball. And there have been other times when it's been incredibly hot uh, and very, very dry and arid. Um, so the Earth will survive, but it's the living species uh, that, that are going to struggle. I mean, humans will find a way to survive, but there's going to be an awful lot of casualties, I'm afraid. Uh, but I worry mostly about wild animals and, and the, the rest of the ecosystem that can't protect itself. You know, we're concreting over everything to build cities. And yeah, we've chopped all the trees down. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's worrying. I mean, I don't, so, I don't want to frighten people. I, I think the great thing, though, is that especially, and funnily enough, I think COVID in a strange way it is having, uh, has had an amazing effect on focusing people's minds on what is really important in life. We have got to change what we do and how we live. And I think COVID has given us an insight to some of the, the things we can do. You know, even this, just talking like this, rather than everybody gathering in a huge conference center somewhere, saves tons and tons of carbon. So the future is, is interesting. And I, and I think technology and innovation and, and the human ability to solve difficult problems it will come through, but it's not going to be easy, that's for sure. And I would encourage so, all of you youngsters to get involved in this, this fight. I mean, it is really, really important. I was going to, I was going to ask that, Chris, finally, is, is, there, is there a message you'd like to give to the, the young people who are watching, um, this yeah, morning? There is no planet B. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a that's a, a good place to end. Um, so thanks for that, Chris. But I, I hope and I hope that that rather somber message is one that doesn't make people feel unhappy or miserable, but you know, really stirs them up yeah. to grasp this challenge um, and really grasp the future and 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 make yeah. a difference and and make less of a mess than some of us older generations yeah. seem to have done. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> But thanks for that, Chris. Sorry we weren't able to post all those questions to you, um, but thank you for everything.
who asked a question. Again, a huge thank you for, to, for joining us this morning, Chris, all the way from, from Thailand. Uh, we wish you all the best with your um, the businesses that you're supporting and the businesses of the future that you're that you're going to be supporting. And we're looking forward to hearing about how they've how they're changing the world. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we're here again tomorrow at the same time with another inspirational speaker. Um, so please do join us then. And in the meantime, have a great day. Hello.